We have done a solid amount of cross-generation Pokemon runs on the channel, but today it's a little bit different. We're going to be taking a look at Shedinja in Pokemon Red, and before you ask any questions, just kind of stick around for a few minutes and I'll do my best to get everything explained. Welcome back to the channel where I like to do Pokemon solo challenges with the ultimate goal of ranking them against each other after several runs with some optimizations using the rules that you can find down in the description. If you are a returning subscriber like Lenny King, I really do appreciate the support, but grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's just start from the top. Shedinja is an extremely unique Pokemon and there are kind of two big things to touch on and draw attention to. Let's bring up the stats and not to call out the obvious, they're extremely, extremely low outside of the attack. Base stat total is very poor, it's pretty much at the bottom of the list. And you might notice the sore thumb sticking out and it's that one HP and it's a little bit worse than that. You might be thinking base HP. Now one of the Shedinja quirks is that it doesn't use the traditional HP formula that other Pokemon use, instead that one actually represents represents one, as in a single point of HP at all stages of the game, whether you are at level 5 or 95. Now we'll come back to this in a bit with the ROM creation and how I kind of pulled that off, but just know that Shedinja having one HP means that you're going to die if a slight breeze hits you. The counterpart to this is the ability. Now normally we don't use abilities in Gen 1, but Shedinja without Wonder Guard, it's kind of like a chicken sandwich without the chicken, if you know what I mean. Essentially this means that only super effective damage can hurt you, and for Shedinja this includes flying, rock, Fuck ghost, fire, and dark. Dark doesn't exist, we can eliminate that. Ghost only has lick for damaging moves. Rock damage in Pokemon Red and Blue is extremely rare, and that leaves pretty much the flying and fire damage. There's gonna be some threats for those two typings, but honestly, there's only like a handful of battles, and that was pretty much the only thing in my mind when I started the challenge. Now we'll come back to Wonder Guard and maybe some other ways we can be damaged soon, but let's keep it rolling. And just to be really thorough at the start, I am using the Generation 8 Learn Set as a base here. We have new moves like Shadow Claw has a high crit modifier like Slash, Shadow Sneak has high priority like Quick Attack, and we all know Shadow Ball, but it does have a defense lowering chance. Metal Claw rounds out the new moves. It does have a 10% attack boost chance, but it's just not a great move. It's worth noting that I'm also starting off with Dig and Harden as well. Harden's a little bit funny, we'll talk about that later. But the TM list, it's really shallow, it's pretty weak. Now I'd like to specifically talk about Swords Dance here, because technically Shedinja can get Swords Dance on its learn set through a transfer, but the fact that Swords Dance is a TR in Generation 8 and it doesn't learn it led me to kind of exclude it just to be more true to my interpretation of how I do these runs. Now we know the basics of Shedinja and we'll go over more soon, but you get the idea. Wonder Guard is going to be broken for a vast majority of the game, and this is as good of a time as any to say that this is a blind run. Given the uniqueness of Shedinja, I wanted to record my adventure into kind of figuring things out, and I think if you watch the optimized version it just would not be that interesting for this specific run as for the start of the game I battle everything outside of the optional rival battle because I just kind of forgot about him and there's literally no danger here nothing can hit you you cannot die and you might be wondering to yourself why even go through the hassle of extra training and it's gonna be because of the rock solid Pokemon trainer so let's kind of dive in let's take a look at Brock let's talk about it Geodude is first and it can't hurt us so it's only a matter of time before we take it out. Dig does some pretty nice damage but if it starts to spam defense curls you can just kind of get through that with the high crit rate of Shadow Claw to ignore the defense boost. But we take it out and we can start to talk about the first instance of other types of damage that can actually hurt Shedinja. On the Onyx it has Bide and we all know that Bide does topless damage. If it uses Bide it moves first it has higher speed and if you can't knock it out in those two to three turns it's game over it's a reset. The extra training was to kind of just ensure that I did more damage to minimize the chances, but here we're going to see that it just never went for Bide, which is pretty lucky. If it did go for it, you could technically try to guess whether it was going to be a two or a three turn Bide. You could try to dig and use that invulnerable turn to maybe avoid some damage, but I don't really get the chance to test it here, but I did want to emphasize topless damage and talk about the threat that it posed because we're going to see more of it later, but that's the end. We get the badge. Moving ahead, just like the first few trainers, nothing can threaten Shedinja. Nothing can hurt it. This means that I'm just kind of leisurely making my way towards Cerulean, but just like earlier, I am picking up extra battles. Even though this was a blind run, I still had some concerns in the back of my mind, so I kind of kept up the extra training, but it's nothing worth talking about or looking at too much. 
So instead, let's go back to touch on a couple of things. First, if you didn't know, this is a custom ROM that I made. The links for the disassembly repositories on GitHub, they are linked down in the description. And if you're a channel member or a Patreon, I do I do release the patch files for you to try out. Now, Wonder Guard is there. It wasn't too hard in itself to implement. You just simply make two variations of like Bug and Ghost, and you just keep Wonder Guard in mind and make the top chart according to that. It works very well. Now, for instance, I would just make something like Ghost Top with two T's, and I would just make that immune to most of the toppings, and then we'll just kind of simulate Wonder Guard, things like rock flying are super effective. I mentioned that earlier. Now it was a fairly simple and a straightforward and effective solution. Now the one HP thing was a nightmare to figure out. If you're downloading the patch file, you're not going to have one HP and that's because digging into the code and modifying it to make only Shedinja maintain that constant one HP while having the rest of the game function normally, it was just honestly, it was a little bit over my head. To solve this, I used third party software. I used Gamehook and some code. Now Gamehook's what I normally use to show all the stats. That's how I configure my overlay. But I made a custom Shedinja version of it essentially to set the bots for HP and max HP to 1 every time I level up to sort of kind of supersede what the game wanted to do. This isn't a perfect solution and we'll touch on that later but you will get to see it be a little bit janky and mess up from time to time. But even keep this in mind, even if it wasn't accurate I'm still going by 1 HP rules meaning that if I got lucky and I had 60 HP in a battle and I survived a hit I would still reset because 1 HP, Shedinja, that's this whole thing. The next thing I'd like to talk about is experience groups. Now you can see on the overlay here I landed on medium fast but the truth is that Shedinja is actually in the erratic experience group. Just like the HP formula modifying and adding new experience groups just it wasn't worth the hassle but to talk about erratic a little bit it's weird. That's the summarization of it. It's weird. It requires the least amount of experience points overall to hit level 100 but from levels 1 to 10 it's pretty significantly slower than the slow leveling group. It's the slowest of all. You can see on this chart here it's the black line and I didn't want to Overall, I didn't want to punish a Dinja too hard by making it in the slow leveling group. So medium fast is just kind of where I landed. Now let's get back to the gameplay. And outside of Bide, you might be kind of wondering, when is the next time Shedinja is actually going to fail a battle? And due to the unknown natures of, of doing a blind run, we're going to see it very soon. At this stage, my mind was set on rival number two. But after I get the candy, I remembered, hey, Misty can't hurt us. So it's just free experience. That would speed things up. It would smooth up Nugget Bridge, that whole section. And you guys know that's music to my ears when I hear Nugget Nugget Bridge being faster, I perk up. I know it's great. So we head over to Misty and there's a familiar opponent that turns out to give me a lot of trouble. This trainer, the Goldine Jr. trainer here, has gotten an intro before in the Parasec race, and all I'm going to say about this one is that I started to kind of gaslight myself. Not one, not two, but three times the battle opens up with a peck. From previous experience, I knew that this trainer did not have good AI, but I started questioning myself. But eventually, on the fourth time, she uses a different move. Supersonic hits me, and of course, I'm going to hurt myself. But this kind of introduces you guys to another form of damage that can actually take out Shedinja. And eventually, on the fifth attempt, I finally get something that goes right. It misses supersonic i get the crit on the shadow claw and it's enough for a one shot so let's move on to misty and we've already talked about this she can't damage us it's a free fight so we're not going to focus on the battle but let me kind of go into like blind run saki in this moment the veal is not completely shattered but the fact that i forgot about the golden trainer kind of got me wondering about what else i was forgetting about this is about the time in the blind run where that one hp frailty started to kind of sink in and the reality that shedinja has no margin for error it has no no leeway in any situation it meant that this one wasn't going to be as easy as maybe i initially thought it would be but let's just keep, keep it going to rival number two this battle is not awful there's actually no threats and you can't lose but here's some foreshadowing for you guys shedinja has one thing one top combination that it just cannot deal with efficiently and it's normal and flying tops shadow claw is great it can mow down pretty much anything and dig is really solid coverage for the fire and rock tops of the world but for now our only option here is metal claw and it's not that great of a move since it's early gust is a normal move in gen 1 it's not a problem but i want you to keep this normal and flying topping in the back of your mind for later as for nugget bridge there are no threats and you'll notice a theme here for shedinja already early in the video is that the times between major fights are almost exclusively fodder outside of some odd trainers here and there and this is the case for most runs most runs don't have any trouble between the major battles but for shedinja specifically you just literally can't be hurt it's just free and you're just sitting here trying to figure out how
how you can get through the route as fast as possible. So that means we're going to skip all the way down to the SSN and we're going to see my Parasect flashback start to, my PTSD start to flare up again. The plan was to do the bare minimum, like always, grab the rare candy and get through this as quick as possible. But the gentleman that's guarding the rare candy had other plans for us. This one is nearly identical to the Golden Junior Trainer in terms of frustration, but there was something awful that pretty much only the Shedinja run could show. As for Growlithe, it's whatever, it's Growlithe, we don't need to talk about it, we outspeed, we have dig, it's the Ponyta where things start to go south pretty fast. The Ponyta outspeeds me, it uses Ember, and that's going to be a reset. And this is where I would like to talk about something. I played this game a lot, I know a lot of things, even minuscule, useless things I know about this game. But this fight, it puzzled me initially, now gentlemen trainers do not have good AI, I don't have the modification 3. But after 6 attempts of Ponyta only using Ember, I just I didn't understand, my brain didn't comprehend. I learned something in this run, and it's the fact that Ponyta is pretty bad. It's one of those Pokemon that only have a single level up move for like 30 levels, and that's Ember. So that means that it literally only has one move, that's Ember, and it's only going to use that against me, and if I want this candy, I'm going to have to try some other tactics. This means for the first time in a long time, I'm actually going to have to stop this battle and go do something else, make a tactical retreat, so we're done here. So I'm going to have to backtrack, and I'm going to have to battle optional trainers until I'm above level 38 speed. And you might be wondering, why not just skip the candy? Is the candy that important? Now with 10 resets already, and I know if you're looking up here, the, the resets are messed up. They will get fixed soon. Don't worry about it. But the idea here, the thought process here was that if I'm having trouble on random ponytas already right now, there's no reason not to train a little bit, get some extra levels, and get this candy. Because if I'm having trouble now, I can only just imagine that having extra candies is going to help me later. So that's what I decided to do. We train up to level 27, we do all the battles in the basement, and there's like one more I have to do. We get up to 39 speed, and when we go back to the gentleman, obviously it's going to be trivial now because we outspeed. But this is just one of those things, I never thought about Ponyta only having one move and outspeeding you. It's just something weird that's kind of unique to Shedinja, and we're going to see a lot of that in this run. But we can go straight to rival number three, and pretty much the same exact thing that we talked about for rival number two is going to come up here. There's no threat, we can take a sand attack, but it's not really that big of a deal and there is something that I only noticed when I'm watching back the footage here I actually speed tie the Charmeleon here and I would be in a similar situation as I was with the pony top I didn't out speed so I get lucky and I win the speed tie and I knock it out but what I'm trying to say overall is that if you did not have 40 or 41 speed here you would just have no chance the rival has good AI I would always use Ember and you would lose this fight forever there's no winning this fight outside of a gen 1 miss but it is something I noticed here now let's take it on to Lieutenant Surge, and you might be thinking, easy battle, he can't do anything, but turn one, Voltorb, Sonic Boom, boom, we're dead. Sonic Boom does topless damage, and we're seeing it come into effect here. Now Voltorb decides that it's going to run it back, not once, not twice, but three resets here by Sonic Boom, and at this point I was thinking, Surge has good AI in red and blue, so maybe it's only going to use Sonic Boom, but it's not the case. Eventually on the fourth time, it uses Screech first, that allows me to get off the dig, the rest of his team can't hurt us, so it's pretty much a free fight after that but you're already seeing like a lot in this early game just through the first three gems of just how many random trainers can just get through wonder guard and since this is a blind run i totally just i didn't expect any of this we don't have to take a look at rock tunnel things are trivial nothing can really do much we're gonna pick up right back in celadon and my thought process here i think i've said thought process too many times let me know top thought process down below we're gonna go down to erica and i do this because in the rocket hideout there is rock damage and i want to make sure i do enough to the onyx to get past it so we're battling every single trainer in erica's gym it's good experience because she can't do anything to you it gives us some extra levels and and we can take a look at Erica herself. Now there is something else that could cause a reset. If you get poisoned, the status move like poison gas or poison powder or something like that, it would bypass immunities and you can get poisoned anyway. So if you didn't one shot everything, you could lose. We don't see it here, but that's just something that could pop up eventually. But we do get another badge. We get some extra levels. And now let's take it straight over to the rocket hideout. I'm getting the high money items. I'm not interested in showing that. You already know what they are. Let's skip straight to this Giovanni fight here. And you're gonna see that dig is good enough just to one shot the onyx
like specifically like i said it does have rock throw you can see it go for rock throw but it misses we just we're underground so it can't hit us anyway but we had to be able to one shot it or we were risking being walled once again the rest of the fight really doesn't matter but at level 36 i get the chance to learn fury swaps and this is the only time you're going to hear me talk about fury swaps metal claw is a bad move 50 base power 95 accuracy now you could argue that fury swaps is worse because there's only a 12.5 percent chance it's going to hit four or five times it only has 80 percent accuracy not good but when you look at total damage potential which would be you know 18 base power times four or five it just would give us a better chance at those normal and flying tops and i guess it's kind of sad when we're sitting here discussing fury swaps is our best option to deal with that kind of stuff but it is what it is hey it's a, it's a shedinja run i promised you guys a shedinja run i didn't promise you guys a good run so fury swaps i learned it over metal claw all you need to know now we're going to skip ahead to the celadon buy and with hindsight and optimizations you would probably hold off on this buy but i did not I didn't comprehend yet the trials and tribulations that Shedinja was going to have to go through. So overall here, I decided to go ahead and buy and pick up items. Now, I will say the most random part, I guess I would say, of blind runs is that you don't know how many vitamins you can get. When you're fully optimized, you know exactly what you get, what it's going to help you do and stuff like that. So I'm just kind of in the dark here, as is the nature of a blind run. So overall, I do pick up four Carbos to maybe hope that we can still use Carbos later. And I round it out with three proteins. That's pretty much it here. And I'm going to call out one more thing. It's the fact that for some reason the way I have it set up to for game hook to set the bots to 1 HP every time I level up it does not like it when you use vitamins and we're gonna see some really janky things come up soon so mentally prepare yourself for like random HP bars coming off of the left side of the screen it is what it is and that's gonna take us over to Pokemon Tower this battle is it's weaker than rival number three we already know it's not a you know if you outspeed the Charmeleon at the end it doesn't matter so I'm showing this fight just so you can see number one you can see that I'm one out of 64 HP you can see that the vitamins have already kind of bugged it out a little bit but what I want you to look at is at the very end of the fight I'm gonna level up at the end hit level 37 and a little HP bar is gonna say hello out the side so that's kind of like weird we're 74 out of 1 HP nothing's making sense anymore the game's kind of broken but it doesn't really affect much I really just wanted to show it off we'll show it a couple more times outside of that Gastly's no problem we outspeed nothing else can hurt us so instead let's keep it rolling that's gonna take us all the way down to the Safari Zone now I am I'm picking up the usual stuff. There's Carbos, there's a Protein, the final HMs of the run. And let me just quickly talk about something that I didn't think about with Shedinja. It's the fact that you don't need healing items. I mean, Shedinja has two modes, one or zero. You're either alive or you're dead. Uh, you can't heal between that. So it was pretty interesting, pretty unique. I don't know if you'll ever see this kind of situation again, but skipping the full restore is just, it was hard. It was going against my very nature of doing these runs, but I thought it was pretty cool. It was something you don't really ever think about. Like you don't have to buy potions, super potions, save a little bit of money. And after that, we're gonna take, we're gonna go down to Fuchsia and we're gonna take a look at the first juggler in Koga's gym. And there's no threat here. This isn't because this is a interesting or hard battle. I just wanna show off the HP again. We go into this battle, we're just randomly 68 out of 68 just because we've been using vitamins. And notice when I level up, it goes crazy. We're back down to 70 to one. Now this HP bar sticking out the left all the way over. It looks like a little pitchfork, a little E that just randomly appears. It's just weird. I wanna document it for you guys. It reminds me of being a kid using the missing no glitch. I know it's missing number, don't comment that please, but the Cinnabar Island glitch where you would see a lot of this kind of stuff if you started catching stuff down there, but it's pretty interesting to me. I thought I would at least show it. And as we get to Koga, there is the potential of maybe having something like poison hit you, toxic or something like that, but I decided to go here just because we have a good top matchup. We have Dig, and if I really need to, I could use Harden for the badge boost. I haven't talked about Harden, but it's really funny to think about Gen 1 in general. I have a Pokemon with one HP that would die to any Thing, and I still have a defense increasing move just because the badge boost glitch is that important but there's not much to say here I avoid the poison and I just kind of dig through everything and I had to come here first because the rest of the game the challenges are kind of immense but we'll get to that but Koga's down we got the speed badge boost always welcome especially with low base HP and now things are gonna start to get a little bit uh, tricky shall I say now we're heading over to Silphco, and your only real options in the game is either to get a Surf user and go down to Blaine, which is a fire top trainer. He doesn't have good AI, but he still significantly outlevels us, so it's not great. And then you have Silphco here, which we decided to go to, but rival number five leads with a Pidgeot. We've been talking about the normal and flying typing a lot, but the main thing that changed here is now Pidgeot actually has a flying move. 
and with good AI, you know, this being a blind run, I really didn't know how bad it could be. So I decided not to train any right here. And instead, let's kind of just, before we talk about it any further, let's just present the case at hand. Let's jump straight into rival number five. And I guess we got to talk about it at some point. There's two gargantuan problems here. The first is that I'm outsped. The second is that the rival has good AI and wing attack. This makes for a solid brick wall challenge that I just can't overcome. And if you're wondering why I throw myself at this a few times, it's because I often just test things out in blind runs. You never know. Maybe it'll gen one miss. Maybe I'm forgetting something. Maybe it has another flying move, but it doesn't. Now I go train for a bit. I'm not gonna show the sylph grinding, but I do get up to level 45 for the next damage rounding threshold. And now I'm past 78 speeds so we can see how this one goes. And remember one thing guys, our highest potential damage output for a normal and flying type is Fury Swaps. And honestly, we get a pretty solid attempt here and it gives me some false hope. It hits four times, it does what looks to be about 75% damage, but ultimately I'm Shedinja and the super effective damage just, it puts us in a bind. On the next attempt, you're gonna see me do a two hit here and it does little damage. And rather than beat my head against the wall, I'm actually gonna give up for the second time in this run and we're gonna have to try to find an alternate solution. With Sabrina locked behind completing Sylph and Giovanni locked behind having the seven other badges, the choice here is to catch a Surf user and we can just head down to Cinnabar. This lets us clear our head a little bit. We can take that nice swift swim, but we're kind of trading one problem for another as you can probably guess. I mentioned flying and fire in the beginning and this is kind of the part of the game where these two toppings put you in a pretty big pickle. To keep it 100 with you guys, I felt incredibly powerless in this run at this stage. So to give myself a little bit more hope and a chance. I do battle all the trainers inside of Pokemon Mansion, inside of Blaine's Gym as well. Now with Pidgeot, our options are really limited, but when it comes to fire types, we actually have Dig. And do not forget that Shedinja, if it has anything going for it, it has at least a solid attack stat. This makes for some overall pretty quick and easy training despite that fire damage risk. At the end of the day, I hit level 49 and I didn't plan on originally showing the blind run for this one and I commit some blasphemy here. I don't even get into a philosophical debate debate with the computer on if Doomstoner brother is actually the 28th TM but Blaine is next and we should probably talk about him just a little bit more. There's one key difference, one huge difference here from rival number five, and it's that Blaine doesn't have good AI. This means I just have a natural innate chance to just win, but I do need some setup. As you're gonna see, this one doesn't go my way, just like the Golden Trainer earlier, but I've played this game enough. I just know that eventually Blaine is gonna be Blaine. Now I started these attempts at 17 resets, and finally, we're gonna get to 23 resets. I get that attempt that I want. It's not really that bad in the grand scheme of things. Now we see some classic Blaine gameplay play here. Classic Blaine. It goes for two straight super potions at full health and that's going to allow me to set up two hardens. Now I don't often talk about the badge boost glitch because I just kind of assume that everyone knows about it because I'm a smaller channel but the long and the short of it if you don't know is due to certain badges giving bonuses like Koga speed boost or Brock's attack boost. I'm going to be able to use a seemingly worthless move like harden on a one HP Pokemon to get enough damage and speed to just kind of dig through his team and there's really not much more to say about it than that. Now there's really almost nothing left to do in the game. We have a huge Pidgeot problem, but at level 50, all we can do is kind of just hope that this is enough to get past it. And I'm not gonna do another intro because I love the intro cards for the trainers, but just doing multiple for the same trainer just seems really excessive. So let's hop back into it and go over it. The first attempt is filled with some hope, but it's shattered when I miss Fury Swipes immediately. And I'm reminded how bad this move is, but this is just the first attempt. No worries, push forward. The second time I hit a three hit Fury Swipe and it does slightly less than half. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty disappointed at how little damage this did, but it's another reset. On the next attempt, this in my opinion is where the run goes off the rails. I get that 12.5% chance to hit the five hit on Fury Swipes and it doesn't even take Pidgeot into the red health. And honestly guys, if that's not enough, it just means that luck or just wasting a massive amount of time is the only way past this, which is really disheartening. 
So I beat my head against the wall here and I would like to talk about something while these massive amounts of failures play in the background. You're going to see me go all the way up to 49 resets here and uh, let me explain why I decided to kind of just keep trying this over and over despite knowing I would probably fail besides the fact that this is a blind run and I usually do this sort of thing anyway. Now I've been into probability and statistics lately. This came about because somebody was being kind of cheaty in like a contest I was kind of following a little bit but that's neither here nor there it doesn't matter but probability and statistics something I've been into let's talk about it in terms of this fight now I need a five hit critical hit fury swaps for a five hit fury swaps it's a 12.5 percent chance and you can see on the screen that Shedinja has a 7.81 percent chance to crit now when you combine those odds the percentage in a vacuum of getting this to happen on like a single attempt is 0.976 percent slightly lower than one out of a hundred now I'm not gonna go into the exact math everybody's gonna start snoozing if I do but suffice it to say that the more you do something the greater the probability is so in this specific scenario the sweet spot for a five hit fury swap critical hit is going to be around 71 or 72 attempts just to kind of state the obvious i didn't have these numbers or these statistics kind of laid out for me while i was doing the blind run but i did know that if i got a crit and i hit a lot i could probably do it so i just decided to kind of you know play a few hands of blackjack if you will and it just kind of turns out that i did 25 hands and just kind of lost everything but that's that's just how it goes sometimes guys you win some and you lose some and that means once again i'm gonna give up and we're gonna move on so the state of morale isn't great we've hit a lot of tough challenges and it's kind of like culminated in ri this rival number five wall and i don't have a lot of options here the likely solution is just to battle basically everything in the game and i'm gonna go to the fighting dojo first now at this point i'm not sure what level you would need fury swipes is bad and it's not even guaranteed that like level 55 or 58 would even make that five hit guaranteed and if you're sitting here you might be wondering hey why aren't you using the rare candies and that's because my mind is all on the bigger picture in the grand scheme guys think about this in the grand scheme of things rival number five is a small fry remember we still have rival number six and eventually we have the champion to get through and it's just gonna be a harder version of this fight and all of that's just kind of like obliviously assuming that the elite four is gonna be easy if I use all my candies now I kind of just risk being in the same position but needing more experience to get past it now it's a bit of a pickle like I said earlier and as you watch me kind of face roll a dojo what if I took you that there's perhaps another option a forbidden fruit if you will something that we never really go for in regular runs because it takes too much time and it's almost always a slower option could this maybe be the savior for should ninja what am i talking about i'm a little bit cryptic we'll get to it in just a second at this point i am picking up every single trainer on sylph but i need money so at this point i'm finding every npc i can find i'm on my knees i'm begging i'm groveling i'm saying please spare some change give me a spare TM so I can sell it and when I'm done with Sylph I'm level 53 and I shamelessly go back to rival number five like a fiend scratching his neck for more crack on the streets but you know the gist I don't have to show it we fail no reason to really look at it now I liquefy all of my possible assets and now we have some money that means I'm gonna get that coin case and you already know it's time for hyper beam it's the only in my head it's the only realistic way out of this nightmare I created for myself and let me talk about this for a second if you're on streams or something like that I do bring this up up, but in gen 1 you can only buy 50 coins at a time I play on times 3 speed and even with turbo buttons it takes a little bit less than two minutes of real time just to get the 5500 coins required since I rank my personal runs off of in-game time I guess the important number here is that this takes roughly five minutes of in-game time just to get these coins and this isn't taking into account other things like you're gonna be skipping vitamins and how is that gonna affect your you know you're a little bit slower you're a little bit weaker how's that gonna affect the run or just grabbing the coin case is getting the TM, learning the TM. It's just a huge time sink. And there's often just, this is essentially like a speed run series. So there's often just faster and more efficient ways to complete runs. But it just so happens that today we found a situation that can only be solved with hyper beam, hopefully. Asterisk, we don't know yet. If level 53 and a 150 base power move isn't enough, this video is just over. I'm done with Shedinja. 
Now for the moment of truth, I let that hyper beam loose and I've never been so happy in my life to watch a bird die. Ladies and gentlemen, we got them and we're seeing the rest of the fight after living in Pidgeot shadow for what feels like years at this point. Now the rest of the fight is going to be trivial. There are threats like poison powder from Execute, Dragon Rage from Gyarados, maybe a fire move from Charizard, but our level just kind of neutralizes that. I thought about setting up just to be extra sure on the Charizard, but I do have the experience to the next level on my overlay, so I knew I would level up going into Charizard but it turns out that our beams and balls they just do enough damage and we can let out a huge sigh of relief and we can finally just get on with our lives put this behind us now let's rapid fire for a bit, finish up the game, or at least we would if it wasn't for another Shedinja surprise. As a ghost type in a ROM where I fixed the psychic being immune to ghost bug, this one should be cake. Now I'm smiling here, I'm happy coming off a big win, I'm celebrating that 5 0 victory, I'm tossing out shadow balls left and right, but we get to the end and Psywave, of all the moves in the game, Psywave hits us and knocks us out, which is a little bit unexpected. There's an obvious solution here, we can just use Harden, get a couple of speed badge boost, and we can outspeed the Alakazam and we can just win easy, but this is another example of how little things you never think of normally come into play for Shedinja. Even though Psywave is absolutely pathetic 99.9% .9 of the time, and we are immune to psychic damage, its damage calculations are unique. All it needs to do is one damage, it'll bypass Wonder Guard, and that's what we just saw. I've said this before, but Psywave, it's an interesting move in the conceptual sense, but it's god awful in its execution. It's so bad, and to see it actually have kind of a use here was pretty cool and by cool I mean pretty annoying as for the final badge, I train up on the underling goons in the gym, and there's not really much to say about this one. I set up badge boost via Harden, I make sure I kind of have enough damage and outspeed everything, and I just kind of safely nuke everything, and we have an actual easy battle which is pretty welcome considering how some of the other fights just went. Now let's dive straight into rival number 6, and not skimping on training leads to another beautiful site where Hyper Beam eclipsed these bird's wings, we're moving on, we're not worried about Pidgeot anymore, thank god. And this one is is in the bag. You already know. I badge boost speed. We're ensuring that we're going to be faster than everybody the rest of the way. And although, like we just said, there are some things that can force a reset, I can just one shot. And things are looking good until I beat Alakazam. That means I level up to 59. I lose the extra speed from the badge boost. And with good AI, Charizard is just going to flambe us into the ground for another reset. Now, the solution here is really easy. I don't want to use candies, and I'm not going to cut the rival music. It's still playing, so just kind of deal with that. But I find one of the very few trainers that I skipped in Pokemon. Pokemon Mansion, battle it and some wild Pokemon, and this should fix our experience overall. Now let's hop right back into the thick of the rival battle, and you'll see now that I level up going into the Alakazam rather than Charizard, and since Alakazam cannot hurt us because Psywave is Sabrina's signature move, I can just set up, get the speed required, and that puts the nail in the coffin, and it goes without saying that this would be a different story if we were tr still trying to use Fury Swipes or Metal Claw. Now my friends, it hasn't been the easiest road, let's not fool ourselves. You don't always see the blind runs on my final videos, but they are often filled with tons of resets and lots of testing, but we've kind of dragged Sudinja's rotting carcass this far, it's time to seal the deal, finish off the run. We only have the Elite Four left, and we're, we've been really stingy with our candies, and I honestly felt pretty good about the champion fight since we've seen how it went with Hyper Beam. Like we've seen time and time again in this run, I'm sure there are going to be some surprises but at level 59, I was content with just picking up the rare candy in Victory Road, skipping all the training. And the real question here is if Shedinja's struggles are over, if we're in the promised land now, or if 53 resets is just the beginning. Let's find out. Lorelei is pretty simple on paper. I wasn't even sure I needed to badge boost, so I kind of just dumped some damage on the dugong and we move on. Next on the cloister, I was gonna set up here, but it has supersonic. Now, we've seen confusion damage before, and ultimately, it hits it, I hit myself, and we quickly have our first reset of the Elite Four. Cool. On the second attempt, it's more of the same, but since supersonic is normal, it's gonna just pick moves at random. Combine that with the 55% accuracy, and I just set up a little baby bit of boost. I take it out, we move on. The next two Pokemon 
Pokemon are Psychic types. They're weak to Shadow Ball. They don't pose much of a threat. But the sort of problem here is that I level up going into the Jinx. And you might be wondering, how does that cost us, you might ask? Well, losing that extra attack and the fact that Lapras has a 100% accurate Confuse move that it deems super effective due to it being Ghost type means that essentially it puts us at a 50-50 chance to get past this fight. Lapras is bulky. It's really hard to one-shot. And at the end of the day, I failed the coin flip. That's another reset. On the next attempt, I'm going to test the waters. I'm going to try to set up on Dugong, see if that changes things. But I get growled a lot. Dugong gets growl happy here. And for a physical attacking Pokemon, Pokemon, Growl is a death sentence. I've seen this story enough, so I just can see this attempt because when you have multiple Growls on you, Lapras is going to be like a 27 shot and it's just, it's not going to work out for you. So let's skip ahead a few more resets. I finally use a single rare candy. I reset my experience so we don't level up and back into the slow bro. I know every badge boost I do is now going to stick to the end of the fight. And the result here is when I finally make it back to the Lapras, I have 355 attack. I let a hyper beam loose, but I crit. We only have a 7% chance to crit. This means that it's going to survive. It uses a retroactive super potion. And since I have to recharge, it gets off that confused ray anyway. And to keep it real with you guys, I would have audibly screamed if I reset here, but I finally get the coin to land on heads. I take it out. And after a few little minor hiccups here that could have been avoided with that candy, we're moving on. Now let's drop down the vibe. Let's get some positive vibes and lower the difficulty a little bit. It's time for Bruno. And I hear you barking, big dog. He has an onyx and it knows rock throw. And you might be wondering what am I ever going to do and you should probably ask Bruno that question not me I decide just to go straight damage test the waters if I reset who cares we would adjust if need be but my boy Bruno he uses two straight X defense he lets his onyx go down and from that point I level up I can just use some badge boost to make sure that everything goes smooth since the hitmonchan can't hurt me and ultimately that's going to lead to a clean sweep and we've had our fun it's another week we've gaffed on Bruno He's a goon, we all know that, but now I think it's time to get a little bit more serious. Thinking about Agatha, my mind was in kind of like a glass half full mentality. I have Shadow Ball and while I might not outspeed anything, I could just nuke it down and combine that with her not having good AI. It's like a kind of like a Blaine situation. It starts off great, Hypnosis miss into a Shadow Ball, and I feel like we're primed just to kind of roll this fight, or at least I wish this was the case. This fight, it's going to be kind of a lesson into why being kind of cautious and being a little pessimistic isn't always bad. If you look at it, all of her team outside of Arbok can make you reset with the main annoyance being Confuse Ray, which we're going to see make a return here on the goal bat. Just talking about the first Gengar, it can put you to sleep, it can use Nightshade, or it can put you into a 50-50 with Confuse Ray, and it knocks me out by itself a ton of times. But when you look at it this way, the Haunter has the same moveset, or the Golbat has things like Confuse Ray, Wing Attack, it just means the likelihood of you getting some level of luck three separate times is really low. But I do know that if you can just get like a couple of setups, get the speed, you'll be golden here. But this is the first real time that Shedinja's poor speed is just really holding it back. So there's no real reason to show every attempt because we've seen and kind of covered what can and what is ultimately just going wrong with this fight. Instead, I'm going to skip ahead and kind of brace yourself here, guys, because we're going to go to reset number 80. And I'm man enough to admit that this fight was pretty much all luck. Maybe in hindsight, you could get rid of Dig, maybe get Mimic, try to take Hypnosis or something, but you're still ultimately giving the Gengar two turns and it's still not going to be great or consistent. What this one all boils down to is that I'm going to fish for an attempt where I use straight Hardens, two straight Hardens on the Gengar. This is going to push my speed up and it's going to make the first two Pokemon trivial, but I was using an extra candy here to reset, but I did forget because I did so many attempts. So on the Haunter, I don't outspeed and once again, it's just going to be up to luck. Thankfully, it just goes for a Dream Eater. I take it out, and the Arbok cannot hurt us. This means that I can just seal the deal. I can set up some Hardens. I can outspeed the final Gengar, and ultimately, that's what it takes to finish this battle. It goes without saying that 21 resets here isn't great. And the solution here was likely just to use a lot more candies. Now, if you can get yourself in a range where maybe one Harden would let you outspeed the Gengar, or even if you just outsped the Golbat and the Haunter naturally, you would have a much easier time. But I'm going to say this again. This is a blind run. Things are never perfect. Things always kind of go this way. And with 80 total resets to this point, this one was anything but ideal, anything but perfect. And if you think the worries are over, Shedinja, it's going to be going for the record today for the most trainer intros in a single video ever. So 
So you might be wondering, what's the problem with Lance? The problem is Dragon Rage. Topless damage has kind of been a thorn in our sides for this whole run, and we, we're gonna see it immediately here on the first attempt. Taking it to the second attempt, I do get some luck here. It actually Gen 1 misses a Dragon Rage, and just to test the waters, I let a Hyper Beam loose with one badge boost. It doesn't knock it out, and even though I have to recharge, it just doesn't select Dragon Rage. I make it through, and now we can kind of look at another problem in the fight. The first three Pokemon, all three of them have Dragon Rage, and I have to set up just a little bit more to win this one. I get taken out again, and on the third attempt, I'm kind of in YOLO mode at this point. I'm progressing, and I even get three setups here, but it's just not enough. I don't outspeed the Aerodactyl, and it has Supersonic, and let me just tell you guys this. The amount of times that I've been hit with this 55% accurate move, and then it got the 50% bad luck chance to hit myself for a reset in this run, it's so high. Speaking of probability, it's just, I, this happens so much to me. It's frustrating, but it is what it is. So we kind of know the layout of this fight. Dragon Rage on the first three Pokemon or Supersonic can knock us out, but there's at least a pretty clear path to victory. I can't stress this enough how weird this run was as, just as a whole. You are immune to pretty much most things and 95% of the game is just trivial to the point to where you can't even lose the battle, but there's just like a handful of things like Confuse Ray, Nightshade, Bide, Psywave, Dragon Rage that just become huge insurmountable problems at times. And honestly, I appreciate the run because of that because it was different. We don't get to see it too much. Now I can definitely say this run was unique because you've seen some failures kind of play in the background here and the Aerodactyl attempts are honestly the worst. The odds are just, I can't stress this enough, the odds are so low it feels really cheaty by the computer, but when you're approaching like triple digit resets, you kind of just don't care anymore. But let's skip ahead just a little bit. We're at reset number 88 and we can just watch the winning attempt. There's not much to really say because we've already kind of laid it out. You just need the opponent to not select a specific move, which feels like the win condition for Shedinja in a lot of these battles. I get bold. I set up three times on the Gyarados. I just don't care anymore. I decide to go for the two shot with Shadow Ball because I was kind of scared that Hyper Beam wouldn't get the one shot. This puts me in a great position to just kind of easily take out the two Dragonairs. I can avoid any potential Dragon Rages. And then we get to our Arch Nemesis Aerodactyl. It has a 100%, a magical 100% chance to hit Supersonic. And it has the special ability to make me always hurt myself on Confusion. Now I'd probably make a bigger deal instead of just being sarcastic about this. But honestly, I'm just glad to finally get it to go down and at the end is Dragonite. This is the one Pokemon on the team that can't do anything to Shedinja, which means that this one is over and now it's all going to come down to one final battle. I do use all of my rare candies. I'm level 73 and let's see if Shedinja can get the moral victory here by not getting to 100 resets. Pidgeot is first, and it's hard to explain the intuition here. I just felt like I needed one Harden, and it, and I just kind of felt like it would go for Sky Attack. And it does charge up the Sky Attack. Now, I knew it had a 50-50 chance to choose between this and Wing Attack, and I just kind of took the risk here. And I'm not even sure if the badge boost helped, but Hyper Beam does one-shot it, and that's very promising, especially when you look at the last two battles. Now, we can kind of just relax our shoulders a little bit. Everything's getting a little tense. The next three Pokemon, they can't hurt us, but it makes our chances higher to win if I do set up a little and after some hardens I take out the Alakazam and ultimately I do a little maintenance to get myself in position as I take out the Rhydon followed by the Executor. The main thing for this fight was ensuring that I had enough damage to one shot the Gyarados to avoid a potential Dragon Rage and to be ready for that Charizard. I do have enough damage for Gyarados here and the rare candies and the extra levels means that I don't level up during the fight. I can retain my boost, I outspeed the Charizard, and a single, a little tiny single tears rolling down my cheek as that hyper beam flows from Shedinja, it connects with a Charizard, and we take it out, and we end the run with a bang. And that's it, my friends. Shedinja has done it. Three hours, 50 minutes, and 30 seconds. It's not an ideal time, and this is normally where we would kind of cut to the optimized run, but I'm content with leaving this one here. If you're interested about a tier card stacked up against those other cross-gen runs, this would have a total score of 1.99. That's 
Not even two points. On a scale of one to 100, that's really bad. Now it's not fair to judge this Pokemon completely off of one blind run. I don't like to do that, but I've kind of seen enough to know that even if we did a few more runs, it just, it wouldn't be great. Could we cut off like an hour of in-game time? Yeah, for sure. Could we cut the resets down tenfold? Definitely. But even a run with those kind of numbers would be pretty bad, really bad, going against things like Alola Nantel, Slacking, or Haxorus. I think overall the challenge of just making this ROM, getting it to work right, and then playing through it, it was enough for me. And I think it's really important in life in general just to know when to stop sometimes, and this is that time. That's about all I got for you. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. I really do appreciate the support, and I think the coming weeks is when I'm going to have to slow down for the first time in years. When this finally comes out, I'm going to be coming off of like five straight week binge of like tests and finals coming up, so in a few days I might need to skip a week or two in October but hopefully this one was worth the effort it took a lot of effort to get this one done we still have a few bangers left to come out hopefully now if you made it this far you're a real one you can comment that down below because it is my favorite comment to see and I'm down to discuss Chedinja strats but sometimes a run is just bad enough to where it's just not worth the optimization and that's kind of what we got today it's a very cool very unique run I'm glad I did it and hopefully I can get this total video down to less than 50 minutes I don't know yet but I'll I'll see you guys in the next one. I'm going to start working on that drowsy run that I did a blind run on stream a while ago. Bye.